Lecture 17, Spirit or Angels, Introduction Hypostasis and Angels In late Judaism, the emphasis of God's transcendence was becoming elevated. This led to the development of the belief in a series of intermediaries who stand between God and the world and thus mediate His action to the world. For the Jews, these intermediaries are the hypostasis, wisdom, the shekinah, the word, as well as angels. Development of language. In the late pre-Christian and non-Christian Judaism, a development of language denoting intermediate beings between God and man came about. As such, in the Hellenistic Judaism, the most striking of these are wisdom, his apparent independent role in creation, like wisdom 8, 4, 4 to 6, and logos, dominant in Philo. In Rabbinic Judaism, there was more tendency to hypostasize the name of God, Yoma 3.8, and the glory of God, the Shekinah, Sanhedrin 6.5. In the Targum Onkelos on Exodus 33.141, we have the Memra of Adonai, the name used in place of the name of God. Torah was also regarded almost as a divine being independent of God. The Spirit of God was also hypostatized in pre-Christian Judaism, treated as semi-independent divine agent, either through wisdom, from the wisdom of Solomon 1, 4, or in the role of the Spirit in creation, Judith 16, 14. Further, in Palestinian Judaism, in their apocalyptic writing, angels have more significant role as intermediaries, including intercessors on man's behalf. Tobit 1215, 1 Enoch 9 3. Delusion or modification. In this pre Christian Judaism, where divine hypostases and intermediaries already exist, would this language develop and translate into dilution or modification of the concepts in Judaism's monotheism? Was there room for an elevated and evolving uh, doctrine of Jesus as divine mediator? or even the doctrine of the Incarnation. Strong resistance from the rabbinic specialists. They have firmly denied that as a room was allowed, the name, glory, the memra serves to protect the transcendence and all otherness of God. The Targums avoided the anthropomorphism of Genesis, using instead the memra of Adonai, like a buffer for divine transcendence. This does not, however, indicate that the rabbis thought of God as remote or distant from men. Rather, the intermediary beings are meant to assert God's nearness, his immanence, but not compromising his transcendence. Thus, the name Gloria, Glory, Memra, circumlocution for God, a reverent way of speaking about God. These are not divine beings distinct from God. Thus, Rabbi Eliezer indicated, he who translates a verse from the Bible, literally, is a liar. He who adds to it, commits a blasphemy. Sitzim Laban for Pre-Rabbinic Judaism However, Pre-Rabbinic Judaism was a much more varied and diverse phenomenon rather than the rigid categories of Mishnah and Talmud. So therefore, we have the queries. Number one, did pre-Christian Judaism provide the language for pre-existence and incarnation? Did it provide a conceptualization of divine hypostasis? Number two, was the spirit already thought of as a semi-independent hypostasis at the time of Jesus? Number three, did pre-Christian Jewish angelology identify Jesus with an angel? Number four, does pre-Christian understanding of spirit and angels give any clue to the why and how of the origins of the doctrines of incarnation. Okay. All right. So, ang pinag-usapan natin as the introduction, ano ba ang meron sa pre-Christian Judaism tungkol sa konsepto ng hypostasis. Well, uh, para, may, may, may mag-explain po ng hypostasis dyan. 
there is more on the concept of essence and person. Sa Greek, uh, sa Greek theology, makikita po natin yung pag-bloom nitong tinatawag hypostasis. Lalo na pag pinag-usapan natin yung hypostatic union na dalawa sa naturalesa ni Kristo. Na dalawang naturalesa, isang persona. So yung hypostasis na yun, yung pag, uh, pagkaroon ng unity between the hypostasis. Uh, Pag-usapan po natin yung pagdating sa Church Fathers. Ano pa? Pero ngayon, ang pag-usapan muna natin ay yung uh, spirit, spirito. Ang magpapatuloy po ay si Brother Jess at ang kanyang ipipresent ay yung, ano ba yung sa pre-Johanna at uh, Judaism uh, concept ng spirito. Ang dali lang po. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Just po muna, sandali lang, sandali lang. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Tonight, the topic I will discuss is about the Spirit of God and pre-Christian Judaism. The continuity of thoughts between Hebraic and Christian understanding of the Spirit is given recognition in this talk. To understand the relation between Jesus and the Spirit of God, we must take into account pre-Christian Judaism. First, we will take up the Spirit as understood in Old Testament literature. From the earliest stages of pre-Christian Judaism, the Spirit or Ruah in Hebrew denotes power, the awful, mysterious force of the wind, of the breath of life, and of ecstatic inspiration, as induced by divine Ruah. In particular, Spirit of God denotes effective divine power. On this understanding, Spirit of God is in a sense not distinct from God but is simply the power of God. God Himself acting powerfully in nature and upon men. Talk of a spirit sent by God as can be found in Judges, first book of Samuel and first book of Kings, is an attempt to resolve the problem of evil within the framework of monotheism. Spirit of God is not merely of a power from God, but of the power of God, of God Himself, efficacious energy. So, there are several examples. First, from the 
First book of Samuel, chapter 16, verse 14, it says, The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Also in the first book of Samuel, chapter 18, verse 12, The Lord had departed from Saul. Also, the wind at the crossing of the Red Sea, the blast or the ruah of God's nostril, that can be read in the book of Exodus, chapter 15, verse 18, and from the second book of Samuel, chapter 22, verse 16. Next, the Spirit of God is synonymous with the breath of Almighty. The power of Ruah, taken as the distinguishing characteristic of God, just as the weakness of flesh, is the characteristic of men. From Isaiah chapter 30 verse 1 and chapter 40 verse 13, it says, My spirit and the spirit of the Lord denote the divine I. Also from uh, the book of Ezekiel, the spirit is synonymous with the hand of the Lord. We can also re read in uh, Psalm chapter 139, verse 7, Your spirit is synonymous parallelism with your presence. And the Spirit of God is speaking of God accomplishing His purpose in the world through men. Clearly, for these writers, the Spirit of God is a way of speaking of God, accomplishing His purpose in His Word through men. The Spirit of God means God in effective relationship with and within His creation. To experience the Spirit of God is to experience God as a Spirit. Now we will discuss spirit during the intertestamental period. The intertestamental period or the deuterocanonical period is the period of time between the events of the proto-canonical books and the New Testament. Traditionally, it is considered to cover roughly 400 years spanning the ministry of Malachi to the appearance of John the Baptist in the early 1st century. According to James Dunn, he see little difference between the usages of Spirit of God in the rabbinic habit of quoting scripture with the words, the Holy Spirit says with those of earlier periods. Psalm 104 verse 30 in Judith chapter 16 verse 14 are simply elaborations of the traditional views that all life is the creative breath of God. In Wisdom of Solomon, it depends on the author's understanding of wisdom and the weather, he regards spirit as hypostasis. In Wisdom chapter 1 verse 7 and Psalm chapter 139 verse 7, the Spirit of the Lord denoting God's cosmic power and presence. In Pilo, the understanding of the Spirit is drawn from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 7. The Spirit is the divine breath which forms the soul or the rational part of the soul. 
he, he speak of the median spirit as the divine breath, breath out on man with spilo attributes prophecy to the divine spirit breath from on high to the state of divine possession or to God who makes full use of the prophet's organs of his speech to set forth what he wills. Josephus also identified God's spirit with God himself since he can speak synonymously both of God's spirit dwelling in the temple and of God himself dwelling in the temple. As for the rabbinic formula, which is the Holy Spirit says, this is what we might call a literary hypostatization. This is a habit of language by use and will not develop what is only a distinction between Adonai and one of these words and phrases used to describe his activity towards men. A literary device to speak of God's action without becoming involved every time of how the transcendent God can intervene on earth. In the period of Judaism, just before the emergence of Christianity, the role attributed to the Spirit seems to have been greatly diminished. The cosmic speculation which gave prominence to wisdom and logos hardly touched Spirit. and Hellenistic wisdom literature, the spirit is hardly given prominence. In talk of divine human relationship, wisdom is the dominant figure. Spirit seem as a way of defining wisdom. <laughs> That we read in Wisdom chapter 1, verses, verse 6, chapter 7, verses 22 to 25, and chapter 9, verse 17. And even prophecy was attributed to wisdom rather than to the Spirit. Philo thinks of the Spirit as the Spirit of prophecy and gives importance to the divine logos in his treatment of creation. In, apocalypt in apocalyptic writings, talk of the Spirit is simply an echo of Old Testament language and swamped by interest in the human spirit, particularly in angelic or demonic spirits. In rabbinic writings, the spirit is preeminently the spirit of prophecy. The only exceptions to all this within pre-Christian Palestinian Judaism were the Qumran Covenanters. Only in the Dead Sea Scroll does spirit come back into prominence. But there is no idea of the spirit as a hypostasis. The Holy Spirit is simply an, a manifestation of God's saving activity. Why did the Spirit faded in prominence in pre-Christian Judaism? Number one, perhaps it was because in Palestinian Judaism, Spirit had become identified with divine eminence, that is the inspiration to prophecy. Perhaps in Hellenistic Judaism, there was too much danger of the spirit 
of Jewish theology becoming identified with the materialistic spirit of Greeks, particularly Stoic thought. Whatever the reason, most pre-Christian Jewish writers professed other concepts and praises rather than spirit when they put into words their experience or understanding of divine eminence. which is of God relation with his creation. In summary, there is little or nothing in pre-Christian Judaism to identify between Jesus and the Spirit, which Paul and John seem to have envisaged, and nothing to provoke the idea of an incarnation of the Spirit in or as a man. The idea of God's Spirit as a power and presence which can be experienced in this world is a well-established thought. Also, with the idea of this divine power inspiring, transforming a man in the hope of such experience again in the future. But of the Spirit as an entity independent of God, of spirit, as a divine hypostasis, there is nothing at this point according to James Dunn. Thank you. All right. So, yun po yung uh, introductory para doon sa Judaic or uh, sa Judaism, uh, pre-Christian Judaism, tungkol sa understanding nila tungkol sa Espiritu. Uh, walang hypostasis na pinapakita sa mga dokumento na nandun doon sa pre-Judaic, uh, pre-Christian Judaism. Ituloy po natin yung treatment sa pamamagitan naman ni Sister uh, Tess tungkol sa Espiritu at si Kristo. Ano ang makikita natin sa discussion doon sa topic na si Kristo, Espiritu at si Kristo. I will now be presenting the talk entitled Spirit of Christ. How do the New Testament writers conceive of the relationship between Jesus and the Spirit? Sa pre-Christian Judaism, ang Spirit ay isang paraan lamang ng paglalarawan ng sariling pagpapakita or self-manifestation ng kapangyarihan ng Diyos, kung saan hindi ito gaanong kilala sa mga naunang panahon ng Christian era, paano ito nakaapekto kay Yesus sa kanyang sariling pangunawa, kaugnay ng Espiritu, at paano iyon nakaapekto sa pagtatangka ng mga unang Kristiyano na ipahayag ang kanilang pagkaunawa sa ugnayan, sa pagitan ni Yesus, at ng Espiritu. Mayroong kapansin-pansing pagkakapare-pareho ng opinyon sa buong dokumento ng bagong tipan at ang pagsasaalang-alang ni James Dunn sa mga kaugnay na materials na maaaring maging paglalarawan kaysa sa nararapat. Jesus, the man of the Spirit. Ano ang ugnayan sa pagitan ni Jesus ng Nazareth at Espiritu ng Diyos? Paano ito uunawain o iintindihin? Ang sagot ni Jesus sa tanong na ito ay mahalaga sa atin. May mga mabuting batayan 
para baliktanawin ang ilang pahayag mismo ni Jesus kung saan ang lahat ay nagbibigay ng pagpapahayag ng consciousness of inspiration, a sense of divine commissioning sa likod ng kanyang pangangaral at banal na kapangyarihan sa kanyang ministry of healing. Matthew chapter 12 verse 28 and Luke chapter 11 verse 20. Since it is by the Spirit or finger of God that I cast out demons, then has come upon you the kingdom of God. With the order of the words, throws the hearer's attention to the Spirit or finger of God as the source of the power which made his act or word of exorcism so effective. Ito ay malinaw na sariling paliwanag ni Jesus para sa kanyang tagumpay bilang isang healer. Isang pagbibigay kapangyarihan sa pamagitan ng Espiritu ng Diyos. May sapat na malinaw na katibayan kung bakit naisip ni Jesus na siya mismo ang tutupad sa sinasabi sa Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 The spirit of the Lord was upon him because the Lord had anointed him to bring good tidings to the poor There is a clear enough evidence that Jesus to have thought of himself as one in whom Isaiah Chapter 61, verse 1 was being fulfilled. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him because the Lord had anointed him to bring good tidings to the poor. Luke chapter 6, verse 20, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 6, Matthew chapter 11, verse 5, and Luke chapter 7, verse 22. The character and effectiveness of his preaching with regard to the poor. Jesus evidently attributed the Spirit of God upon him and working through him to the commissioning and empowering of God himself. Jesus seems to have thought of himself as a prophet standing within the prophetic tradition. Ang kanyang kahandaan na ipahayag ang kanyang sarili bilang siyang sinugo ng Diyos. Matthew chapter 10 verse 40, Luke chapter 10 verse 16, Matthew chapter 15 verse 24. Hindi siya nahirapang ilarawan ang kanyang sarili sa tuwirang propetikong pananalita. Propeta na ang isa sa kahulugan ay propetang binigyan ng inspirasyon ng Espiritu. The one who is inspired by the Spirit. Batay sa parehong ebidensya, hindi lamang isang simpleng propeta ang pananaw ni Jesus sa kanyang sarili. Nakita niyang kakaiba ang kanyang tungkulin. Isang eschatological prophet, Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1, of the coming one, the anointed one of prophetic hope. Matthew chapter 11 verses 1. 3 to 6, Luke chapter 7 verse 20. Only through His Spirit-empowered ministry was the eschatological rule of God realized. Matthew chapter 12 verse 28, Luke chapter 11 verse 20. Something greater than Jonah. Matthew chapter 12 verse 41, Luke chapter 11 verse 32. His concept of his ministry, his understanding of himself, did not break clear of prophetic language. Maging ang kanyang paboritong self-designation bilang anak ng tao at ang kanyang pag-unawa sa kanyang kaugnayan sa Espiritu ay naaayon sa malawak na saklaw na nakapaloob sa kategory ng pagiging propeta. Ngunit ang kanyang konsepto ng Espiritu ng Diyos ay tila ganap na aayon sa kung ano ang nalaman natin alinsunod sa pangunawa ng mga Hudyo. Spirit of God as a way of explaining an experience of inspiration 
and effective power as coming directly from God Himself. The disagreement between Matthew and Luke as to whether Jesus spoke of the Spirit of God or finger of God. It comes to the same thing anyway. Both praises attribute the exorcisms to God's own power. That is why the exorcisms can be understood as manifestation of the final rule and victory of God over evil. Ang pagkakapareho sa pagitan ng mga phrases, ang Espiritu ng Diyos ay sumasa akin. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and the Lord has anointed me. Hinirang ako ng Diyos. Naunawaan ni Jesus ang kanyang kaugnayan sa Espiritu in terms primarily of inspiration and empowering. Kung saan ang kapangyarihan ng Diyos ang pumupuno sa kanya at nahayag sa pamagitan niya. The same emphasis is also a feature of the earliest preaching of the Jerusalem community. We may note the speeches attributed to Peter and Stephen in Acts 3 and 7, where the Deuteronomy 8, chapter 18 verse 15 is explicitly quoted, the promise of Moses. God will raise up for you a prophet from your brethren as he raised me up. Acts chapter 3 verse 22, chapter 7 verse 37. The message is clear enough. Jesus is the one in whom this prophecy has been fulfilled. He is a prophet like Moses, the one whose intimacy of relationship with God and whose fullness of inspiration by God would mark the climax of God's purpose for Israel, just as the same feature, feature had marked out Moses in the heyday of Exodus and the giving of the law at Sinai. Acts chapter 10 verse 38 where Peter reminds Cornelius how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. This is an ancient evangelistic formulation made probable by the primitiveness of the title used for Jesus. Jesus, him from Nazareth. And the indications that behind the passage lie primitive exegetical traditions using particularly Psalm 107 verse 20, but also Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1. The point is once again that Jesus was presented as a man inspired by God as one whose secret of success was the outworking of divine power through him, or whose secret of success was that God was with him. We may note the way in which Jesus' death from earliest Christian times was also presented as in continuity with the death of the prophets. Mark chapter 12, verses 1 to 9, Luke chapter 13, verse 33, Acts chapter 7 verse 52 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 15. Paul does not help us much here. Dahil kakaunti lamang ang sinasabi niya tungkol sa pre-Easter Jesus. Though it is certainly plausible that in Rome chapter 1 verse 3, according to flesh, according to the spirit, ang antithesis na sumasalamin para kay Paul ay mas Karaniwang kahulugan ay ang eschatological tension in which the believer is caught. It is possible that Paul meant that Jesus' installation as Son of God in power, according to the Spirit, was in part at least the consequence of his having lived according to the Spirit. Paul delivers hope of sharing in the resurrection of uh, 
of a spiritual body, body of the spirit, was at least to some extent dependent on their living according to the spirit now. And Paul did regard Jesus' resurrection as the archetype of believers' resurrection. Rome chapter 8 verse 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20. At his first generation stage of Christian apologetic, Jesus was presented in prophetic terms. The first Christians also understood the relation between the earthly Jesus and the spirit in terms of inspiration and empowering. When we turn to the Gospel's presentation of Jesus, mapapansin pareho ang pagkakalarawan nila. Si Jesus ay palaging inilalarawan kung saan ang kanyang ministry ay binigyan ng kapangyarihan ng Espiritu, one whose effectiveness is to be explained in large part by, by a unique measure of divine power na mismong naranasan niya at ang epekto na naranasan ng iba sa pamagitan ng kanyang mga salita at gawa. Nagsimula lamang ang kanyang ministry pagkatapos na bumaba sa kanya ang Espiritu sa Hordan. Lahat ng Ebanghelyo ay sumang-ayon dito. Kabilang na si John and probably Q. So, pag sinabi po natin Q, uh, tinatawag din Quell, meaning source. It is a hypothetical written collection of primarily Jesus' sayings. All three synop synoptics agree that this heavenly annunciation and anointing was immediately followed by a period of testing into which Jesus was driven by the Spirit which had come upon him. Mark chapter 1 verse 12, Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, and Luke chapter 4 verse 1. Again, evidently understood as a necessary preliminary to his ministry. Matibay ang pagkakaisa ng lahat ng apat na antas ng synoptic tradition na ang isa sa mga katangian ng ministeryo ni Jesus ay malinaw na pagpapakita ng kapangyarihan ng Espiritu, malinaw na katibayan ng eschatological rule of God, upang ang anumang pagtanggi na kilalanin ito ay bumubo ng isang di matatawarang kalapas tanganan. Karamihan sa mga commentators ay sumasang-ayo na sa mga salita ng mga kalangit na tinig sa Mount of Transfiguration, merong sadyang pagtukoy o tinatawag nating deliberate allusions sa Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15. Ang salitang makinig sa kanya samantalang sa Mark chapter 9 verse 7, pakinggan ninyo siya. All three synoptics maintain the earlier equation of Jesus with a prophet like Moses. Beyond this, evidence becomes more diverse. Matthew, and particularly Luke, go out their way to emphasize that the whole of Jesus' ministry, all his healing and preaching, was in the power of the Spirit, in fulfillment of Jewish prophecy. Matthew chapter 12 verse 18, Luke chapter 4 verse 18, Luke chapter 4 verse 14, chapter 10 verse 21. They emphasize that not only his ministry, but his very life itself was brought about by the same divine power. Not just his ministry, ministry but his whole life was a manifestation of the power of God. Matthew chapter 1 verse 18, 20, Luke chapter 1 verse 35. Mark does not hesitate to use a very forceful word like drive out, expel, in describing the Spirit's compulsion under Jesus, under which Jesus went into the desert to be tempted, Mark chapter 1, verse 12. Very much a picture of the prophet compelled by a power he cannot gain see. Matthew and Luke both soften the picture by altering the verb. 
Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, Luke chapter 4 verse 1. That Luke has some fondness for it, describing Jesus as a prophet. Luke chapter 7 verse 16, 30, chapter 12 verse 33, chapter 24 verse 19. And that Matthew and Luke both develop the elements of Moses' typology in their presentation of Jesus. Matthew, for example, by his clearly implied parallel between the slaughter of the innocents in Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 and 18, and Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, and by his gathering of Jesus' teaching into five blocks. And Luke, by presenting Moses and Elijah as speaking with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration about his exodus. Luke chapter 9, verse 31. And by his allusions to Deuteronomy in his travel narrative. There can be a little doubt that the evangelist also understood the relation between Jesus and the Spirit in terms primarily of one inspired and empowered, a prophet like Moses. For the evangelist, Jesus was never just another prophet. Much more was he Messiah, the anointed of the Lord, the uniquely commissioned agent of God's purpose at the end of the age. But this was a role they were able to they were able and content to describe in prophetic terms. It is true that the language is beginning to prove less satisfactory as we draw near to the end of the century, where Mark and Matthew show that Jesus promised to his disciples of inspiration in times of trial was in terms of divinely given inspiration. Mark chapter 13, verse 11, Matthew chapter 10, verse 19. Luke presents it in one version as a promise Jesus himself will fulfill. I will give you a mouth and wisdom. Luke chapter 21, verse 15. Jesus presented as looking forward to the time when he will be the inspirer rather than the inspired. So, mapapansin natin dito ang pagsulong o yung pagunlad ni John. Like Mark, John describes, describes Jesus' spirit in very human terms. Mark chapter 2 verse 8, 12, John chapter 11 verse 33 chapter 13 verse 21 na siya namang iniiwasang gamitin ni na Matthew and Luke but where Matthew and Luke describe Jesus' death in terms of his human spirit Matthew chapter 27 verse 50 Luke chapter 23 verse 46 Gamit naman ni John ang um, open to argument phrase, he handed over the Spirit in chapter 20, verse 22. And seems thus already equate Jesus' Spirit with the Holy Spirit. Maniwanag na si John, the fourth evangelist, is moving beyond the more limiting confines of a prophet Christology. John still retains so much of the prophet language, and he still retains the description of Jesus as one endowed with the Spirit at Jordan. John chapter 1 verse 32, chapter 3 verse 34. Even though he sees Jesus as the incarnation of the eternal Logos, Full of grace and truth, John chapter 1, verse 14, he is unable to dispense with the earlier picture of Jesus as a man inspired by the Spirit. So, meron na po tayo important finding for our study. Jesus is presented consistently as a man of the Spirit 
during his life and ministry. Not as one who could freely dispense the Spirit. Even in John, the Spirit was not yet until Jesus was glorified in death, resurrection, and ascension. John chapter 7, verse 39. Nor as one who on embodiment or incarnation of the Spirit. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. From Jesus himself to the fourth evangelist at the end of the first century, Jesus is understood as a prophet. More than a prophet, to be sure. But so far as the relation between Jesus and the Spirit is concerned, the category of prophet consistently provides the most suitable language and understanding. Jesus of Nazareth, a man inspired and enabled by the power of God to fulfill his eschatological role. The Life-Giving Spirit, the Lord of the Spirit If the testimony of the New Testament writers on the relation between earthly Jesus and Spirit of God is clear enough, what of their testimony on the relation between exalted Christ and Spirit of God? If the earthly Jesus was a man of the Spirit, what of the risen Christ? At the first, the answer seems clearly also. He who on earth was a man, inspired by the Spirit, by his resurrection, became the one who dispenses the Spirit. Siya na nasa lupa bilang isang tao, kinasihan ng Espiritu sa pamagitan ng kanyang muling pagkabuhay ang siyang naging tagapaghatid ng Espiritu. This seems to be the message of Luke, Acts, and John, the only New Testament writing which gives us anything approaching a before and after Easter comparison on this point. In Luke, Acts, Jesus' relation to Spirit, like His divine sonship, seems to fall into three stages. First, when His human life was the creation of the Spirit, Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Second, when He was anointed with the Spirit and became the uniquely empowered man of the Spirit. Luke chapter 3, verse 22, perhaps even begotten to a new level of sonship. Chapter 3, verse 22. Chapter 4, verse 18. Acts, chapter 10, verse 38. This stage continued after his resurrection until his ascension. Acts, chapter 1, verse 2. And third, when on his exaltation to God's right hand, it was given to him to pour out the Spirit on others. Acts chapter 2, verse 33. So, too, in the fourth gospel, the glorified Jesus is presented as the one from whom the Spirit will come, the one who will send the paraclete, the one who bestows the Spirit. We might also note the Baptist prediction of one to come, who would baptize in spirit and fire. All the evangelists are agreed that this prediction was not fulfilled by Jesus before his death. And Luke and John are quite explicit that its fulfillment marked the beginning of Jesus' ministry as the glorified and exalted one. This should not be taken to indicate in Luke and John's view the exalted Christ has completely taken over the role of God as the one who gives the Spirit. For in Acts chapter 1 verse 5 and chapter 11 verse 16, the promise of the Spirit is put in the divine passive. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And in chapter 15 verse 8, the gift of the Spirit is explicitly attributed to God. Indeed, even in chapter 2 verse 33, the exalted Jesus 
is simply the intermediary and the bestowal of the Spirit, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this, and John is equally happy to say that it is the Father who will send the Spirit. John chapter 14, verse 17, 26, even chapter 15, verse 26, where Jesus says, I will send the paraclete to you from the Father. Their testimony is clear. By virtue of his resurrection and exaltation, Jesus, the man of the Spirit, became Lord of the Spirit, the one whose ministry was uniquely empowered by the eschatological Spirit became, by his resurrection, the one who bestowed the Spirit on others. Or by his resurrection, he began to share in God's prerogative as the giver of the Spirit. How early does this understanding of the relation between exalted Christ and the Spirit is started? The evidence considered does not provide a clear answer. We cannot be certain whether Acts chapter 2 verse 33 is drawn from early tradition. It is probable that the Baptist production was cherished by the first Christians as having been fulfilled by Pentecost and outpourings of the Spirit. We have four observations on Paul's theology. One, Paul's readiness to describe the Spirit as the Spirit of Christ the Spirit of God's Son, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Rome chapter 8 verse 9, Galatians chapter 4 verse 6, and Philippians chapter 1 verse 19. Paul never actually attributes the Spirit to Christ as the one who bestows the Spirit on others. He regularly calls the Spirit the Spirit of God. He regularly describes God as the one who gives the Spirit. The divine passives of Rome chapter 5 verse 5, 1 Corinth chapter 12 verse 13, baptized in the Spirit, again, not attributed to Christ, as in Acts chapter 1 verse 5 and chapter 11 verse 16, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13, also 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 and Titus chapter 3 verse 5. In Paul, Christ is Lord, but never explicitly in relation to the Spirit. Where Luke and John seem happy to, att to attribute the gift of the Spirit equally to God and to the exalted Christ, Paul thinks only to attribute it to God. Here, we might mention also Paul's Midrash on Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 to 35 in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 7 to 18. So, uh, meaning po ng Midrash, uh, it is an ancient commentary on part of the Hebrew scriptures attached to the biblical text. In the course of interpreting the significance of that story in typological or allegorical fashion, he identifies the shining of Moses' face as the fading glory of the old dispensation, verses 7 to 11. The veil Moses put over his face as that which still hides the temporary character of the old covenant from the Jews, verses 12 to 15. And the Lord, to whom Moses turned, and before whom he removed the veil as the Spirit, verses 16 to 18. Verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit. It has frequently been taken as Paul identifying the exalted Christ with the Spirit. But in fact, the clause is intended as the interpretative key to unlock the meaning of Exodus chapter 34, verse 34, cited in chapter 3, verse 16. As the New English Bible rightly translates, However, as scripture says of Moses, whenever he turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now, the Lord of whom this passage speaks is the Spirit. 
chapter 3, verse 16. And this interpretative equation between Yahweh of the Old Testament text and the spirit of his reader's present experience, he continues into verse 18. And because for us there is no veil over the face, we all reflect us in a mirror of the splendor of the Lord. Thus we are transfigured into his likeness from splendor to splendor. Such is the influence of the Lord who is spirit. The point for us is the identification Paul thus makes between Yahweh and the spirit. Where it would appear the Lord equals spirit equals spirit of the Lord. Verse 17. For Paul, the spirit experienced by the first Christians is to be identified with the presence of Adonai, which Moses experienced whenever he went in before the Lord to speak with him. Exodus chapter 34, verse 34. The spirit is the presence of Adonai. Paul clearly stands within the mainstream of Jewish thought about the spirit. For Paul, as much as for the earlier Jewish writers, the Spirit is the dynamic power of God Himself, reaching out to and having its effect on men. Paul is clear enough that some sort of transformation in the relation between Jesus and the Spirit took place at Jesus' resurrection, as his use of the older formula in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, appointed Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, as from the resurrection of the dead. And the very phrase, the Spirit of Christ, indicates. Paul firmly believed both that Christ's resurrection was the archetype of every Christian's resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, chapter 4, verses 4 to 9, and that the Christian's resurrection would be affected by the power of the Spirit. Rome chapter 8, verse 11. But he seems to shy away from the logical corollary that Christ resurrection was also affected by the power of the spirit in rome chapter 8 verse 11 if the spirit of him who raised jesus from the dead dwells in you he who raised christ jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you where it would have been much easier to say if the spirit that dwells in you gave life in Jesus, he will also give life to you. Paul is happy to speak of Christian's resurrection body as a spiritual body, a body of spirit, a body beautified by spirit, but he never quite brings himself to say that of Christ's resurrection. He uses near synonyms, glory of the Father, power of God, but never the more specific God raised Jesus by, through the Spirit. If Paul hesitates to present the exalted Christ as Lord of the Spirit, he also hesitates to present Jesus' risen life as a creation of the Spirit. Number three, the relation between Christ and Spirit becomes clearer when we realize that Paul regards Jesus as now, in some sense, the definition of the Spirit. It is the Jesus character of His and His converts experiences of the Spirit which marks them out as authentic. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. The experience of inspiration is authenticated as an experience of the Holy Spirit when the Lordship of Jesus is affirmed. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. The hallmark of a life led by the Spirit of God is the experience of sonship, an experience which reproduces Jesus' own relationship with God, Abba, Father, so that the believers becomes thereby a fellow heir with Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. The Spirit of God may be recognized as that power which transforms the believer 
into the image of God as mirrored in the face of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 to 16. If the spirit is the spirit of the body of Christ, then the action of the spirit may be known as that power which enables the members of the body to function charismatically, in harmony, and grow together towards the full stature of Christ. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, Romans chapter 15 verse 5. In all these instances, Paul seems to think of the Spirit as in some sense determined by Christ, not in the sense that Christ himself has taken control of the Spirit, but in the sense rather that the Spirit has been shaped and characterized by its relationship to Jesus, both the earthly Jesus, particularly Romans chapter 8 verse 15, and the exalted Christ, Romans chapter 8 verse 29, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 49. That power in which he lived a son then and now is the power of the Spirit. Only that power may be recognized by Christians as the Spirit of God. Number four, the relation between exalted Christ and the Spirit can be expressed even as an equation. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. The last Adam became the life-giving Spirit. The last Adam is obviously Christ. But it is equally obvious that the life-giving Spirit is the Spirit of God. The parallel with 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 6, the Spirit gives life. Not to mention John chapter 6 verse 63, it is the Spirit that gives life. Puts this beyond dispute. Romans chapter 8 verses 9 to 11, the Spirit of God dwells in you. You have the Spirit of Christ and Christ is in you are all synonyms, formulations, just as in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 46, the same Spirit, the same God, and the same Lord are all equivalent expressions to describe the source of the diverse grace. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Paul likens the relationship between Christ and believer to the physical union of sexual intercourse. He who is united to a prostitute is one body, but he who is united to the Lord is one spirit. As one body is the medium of union between two human beings, so a spirit is the medium of union between the exalted Christ and the Christians where probably Paul is thinking of both the spirit of Christ and the human spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. These passages make it abundant, abundantly clear that for Paul, no distinction can be detected in the believer's experience between exalted Christ and the spirit of God. The experience of new life and of charismatic endowment can be referred equally to God, the Spirit, and the exalted Christ. The experience of intimate union with the exalted Christ is only possible in so far as Christ can be understood and recognized in terms of spiritual power. If Christ is the definition of the Spirit, then the Spirit is the medium for Christ in his relation to man. For Paul, Christ can be experienced now only in and through the Spirit, indeed only as the Spirit. Paul's view of the relation between Christ and the Spirit is more complex than the sort of formulation with which this section began. If we attempt to summarize, it would have to be along the following lines. For Paul, 
it would not be true to say that the exalted Christ was Lord of the Spirit. By his resurrection, he did not gain the authority of the one God to dispense the Spirit to man. But neither would it be true to say that his resurrection life was simply a creation of the Spirit. He was the first of a new resurrection humanity, the firstborn from the dead of a new family of God. But he was not simply the first man to be raised by the power of the Spirit. Spirit of Christ means the Spirit who inspired the earthly Jesus so that the character of his life on earth before God shows us what the character of a life led by the Spirit now should be. But it must also denote the Spirit of the exalted living Christ since equally by definition, the Spirit is the Spirit that makes alive. The character of the Spirit as the life giver is equally determined by the character of Christ's resurrection. If is the power of life through beyond death that the Christian experiences, it is the risen Christ who is the pattern for the new humanity. For Paul, the Spirit of Christ means the Spirit of Christ, past and present. The exalted Christ and the Spirit of God are one and the same so far as the believer's experience is concerned. In Paul's understanding, the exalted Christ is not merely synonymous with the Spirit, has not been wholly absorbed as it were by the Spirit, so that exalted Christ becomes merely a phrase to describe the Spirit. For Paul, the exalted Christ has a real existence in relation to God. The equivalence between Spirit and Christ is only a function of the believer's limited perception. To sum up, it would appear in Paul's thought, the exalted Christ assumes a uniquely intermediate status. Before God, he appears as firstborn son, firstborn of a new family of resurrect humanity, first installment of a new relationship between God and man. Before man, he appears as life-giving spirit, as the one who makes that relationship possible for others, not just living spirit, but life-giving spirit. How was the relation between exalted Christ and the Spirit conceptualized by the New Testament writers? By his resurrection and exaltation, Jesus had become Lord of the Spirit. Luke and John shared something of Paul's understanding of the exalted Christ as both, in some sense, identical with the Spirit, in the believer's experience and are standing before God as son in his own right as well as for others. How was the relation between Jesus and the Spirit understood in the beginning of Christianity? We can summarize our findings as follows. Number one, for the New Testament writers generally, the Spirit is the Spirit of God, the effective power of God himself. This is obviously true when speaking about Jesus' conception and of his ministry, but is also true in speaking of the Spirit after Jesus' exaltation. However, much the Spirit can be un understood as the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit is still primarily the Spirit of God, God himself reaching out to and touching, vitalizing, dynamizing man at the heart of his being. At this point, earliest Christian thought is wholly of a peace with its Jewish antecedents. Number two, this power Jesus of Nazareth experienced in a unique eschatological measure during his life. He himself claimed as much, and the evangelist reinforced his claim. According to Matthew and Luke, his very conception was affected by this power, so that his anointing at Jordan was a further experience of that power 
an enhancing of the power of God already manifested in his very life or a special equipping for his mission as the decisive figure of God's purpose at the climax of the age, whether expressed in terms of Messiah or eschatological prophet or whatever. Not least of significance in our inquiry is the consist consistent way Jesus himself, the earliest Christian apologist and the New Testament writers generally speak of Jesus' relation to the Spirit in prophetic terms, not as an embodiment of the Spirit or, in, or incarnation of the Spirit, but as a man inspired by the Spirit. Number three, all agreed to that with the resurrection, a new phase began in Jesus' relation to the Spirit. Paul hesitates to present Jesus' resurrection simply as the work of the Spirit, and Luke and John are willing to go further and present the exalted Christ as Lord of the Spirit. The clear implication is that none of them wanted to think of Jesus' risen life as a creation of the Spirit in the way that Matthew and Luke presented Jesus' earthly life as a creation of the Spirit. A transformation had taken place in the relationship between Jesus and the Spirit. Jesus' risen life is different from that of believers who follow him. The last Adam became not just a spiritual body, not just living spirit, but life-giving spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. For Paul, the exalted Christ is representative man, last Adam, firstborn of a new family, whose image man will share in the resurrection. He is not merely the Christ, not merely a field visionary whose heroic spirit still inspires today, but the Christ who fulfilled his vision, who himself is the guarantee and archetype of the new risen humanity, though how the spirit relates to Christ in terms of his own risen humanity is left obscure. So in some sense, that is not clear. The life-giving spirit and exalted Christ merge in Paul's thinking. The spirit can now be thought of as the spirit of Christ, as that power of God which is to be recognized by the consciousness of oneness with Christ and in Christ, which it engenders, and by the impress of the God, of the character of Christ, which it begins to bring about in the life of the believer. But in another sense, spirit and Christ remain distinct. It is of a distinct personality that the spirit confesses Jesus is Lord. The paradox can be stated but not resolved. Thus, if the exalted Christ is to the believer as life-giving spirit, he is to God as firstborn son. It is presumably in this indeterminate intermediate role of the exalted Christ between man and God, a son, and between God and man, a spirit, that we find the uncomfortable dynamic, which was an important factor in pushing Christian thought in a Trinitarian direction. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Tess. All right. And ito po ang gagawin natin. Kung may mga naisip kayong tanong ngayon, pag-usapan ninyo sa breakout room. Magkakaroon tayo ng breakout room siguro for about uh, 30 minutes. And then by the time na makabalik kayo, pakilista nyo na yung pwede nyong tanong. So, itatry nating sagutin uh, yung mga nag-present at saka yung uh, kung meron tayong may, may, may bibigay, pag-usapan po natin para makita natin. So, uh, random po ang magiging uh, arrangement ninyo.
Maglalagay ilan tayo ngayon? 29. Oh, so, okay. I-randomize ko po kayo. Siguro mga lima-liman, bawat uh, isang grupo. Mag-usap-usap kayo. Then, limiinin nyo kung anong pwede nyo itanong. And then, gawin natin siya after 30 minutes. So, by uh, 49, meron tayong mga 15 minutes na pan. Pwede tayong magtanungan at mag, magpahayagan. Ano pa? Ah, sandali lang. <coughs> 
Hello. Dalawa lang kayo dito. Hello. Bakit lalaki? Wala yung iba. Oh, sige, nag-uusap kayo. <laughs> oh, nag-uusap kayo ni Regina, ha? O, maya magkuhan yung mga tanong ninyo doon sa breakout, ay sa kwan, sa main call, ha? Okay. Dalawa lang na dito, dahil kasi wala yung one, two, Tatlo yung naka, na, hindi ko alam kung nasa labas o absent. Ito lang kasi yung nandito eh. Hindi. Ang, 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 ang nasa labas, tatlo lang eh. So, hindi nakapasok siguro to. Pumasok pero hindi hindi nakapag-out. Absent. Parang absent eh. Amen na. Mag-usap muna kayo ha. Hello po. Antay tayo lang. Antay. Wala pa lang dadating. Mula naman, wala, uh, hindi ako, hindi ako gaano nakapag-notes eh. Um, although maganda yung talk ni ano, sisters about dun sa gospels, di ba? Ikaw sis, kung meron kang may tatanong, okay lang, okay lang ako. <laughs> Makikinig tayo. <laughs> oh, nga. Baka, baka hindi rin ganong nakatutok eh, yung iba. Sige po. Okay. Ah, ano, mag-out na ba tayo? Ah, return to main call na pala tayo. Balik, balik na tayo. Sige po. like storming up uh, here and on the Sunshine Coast and like, there's so much thunder and lightning going on outside. Um, but anyway, I don't know if you guys can hear that. What's it all like where you are? Is it cold? It's summer here in Australia at the moment. So um, we typically are having nice weather, but we're having a yeah, bit of a storm today. All right, so with the cabbage, I want to...
Hello. 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 Yes. Are we back? Yes. And the lang. Antay natin yung iba pa. Hello. Hello. We are back. Yeah. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> We are back to the main call. Yan Actually, bago pala po nagiinit yung tanungan na. <laughs> Sorry. In that case, we need ito itanong kay Bro Resti. <laughs> Ayan, tama po. Uh, Kuya Resti, sige po. May, kanina. Itanong niya lang po kay Kuya Resti yung tanong ninyo sa amin. Yung, kung okay. ano, okay, para mas maliwanag ang buka. Nasa labas sa yata lahat. Nasa mas... labas sa yata lahat. Sige pa, ano pong tanong ninyo? Brother Resti. Yes, ma'am. Assuming, assuming I'm I'm still ignorant or innocent and I know nothing about God. How will you explain to me that Jesus is God and the Trinity is one? Teka, ang layon natin pinag-uusapan. Hindi yan pinag-uusapan natin kanina. Ang pinag-uusapan natin, po, diba? Espiritu, anong pagkakaintindi ni Kristo at sa anong ibang tao tungkol sa pagiging Espiritu. Hindi okay, pa na, na kasi ang ginagawa kasi natin dito sa po na ito, talagang isang full exegesis. Iniisa-isang uh, iniisa-isang uh, liwanagin ano yung mga pagkakaintindi nung panahon na yun ay nangyari. Pre-Christian and then Christian era, anong pagkakaintindi nila sa spirito? Hindi pa yan mabubuo yung konsepto ng Trinity at saka konsepto ng uh, Godhead ni Kristo ay mabubuo yung pagdating natin doon sa Church Fathers. Kasi ando doon yung Christological, uh, Christological question. Uh, kung kayo naka-attend na nung uh, uh, Church Fathers, ando doon po yung mga Christological heresies. At doon in-explain kung bakit. So, ando, pag nandoon na tayo, saka natin pag-usapan yun. Na kasi, sasama kasi ngayon yung uh, pinag-uusapan nating uh, philosophies. Kasi, to give you an overview lang, may dalawang uh, critical na, na, na konsepto na na-generate doon sa konsilyo, mga councils. Councils, no? Yung osia, meaning uh, the, the essence, at saka yung hypostasis yung pinaka nature. So yun yung pinag-uusapan kanina, ang ang espiritu ba was considered a hypostasis noong panahon ng mga Hudyo. Hmm. Ang unang naging lumabas sa usapan uh, sa usapan nila sabi, wala sa konsepto ng mga Hudyo ang hypostasis because ang kanilang pagkakaintindi that is only a circumlocution, meaning para hindi ma para yung yung uh, dignidad ng Diyos ay hindi ma Uh, malamatan kinakailangan nilang uh, magkaroon ng circumlocution meaning pinaiikot yung sabi kaya nga, gaya ng nakikita natin dito ang mga hudyo hindi ipinopronounce yung pangalan ng Diyos yung yod he ba okay hindi yan pinopronounce ng Diyos dahil, uh, ng, ang, ng mga hudyo kasi sa kanila sagradong masyado yun So gagawa sila ng tinatawag na circumlocution, pinapaikutan basically, basic basically. Pinapaikutan yung salita at ang sinasabi niya ay Adonai, meaning the Lord. Ganun ang pagkakaintindi ng mga Hudyo. Ang ang hypostasis kasi talagang magiging uh, ang naturalesa at saka yung esensya ay malalaman kung mer- meron bang esensya na hiwalays ang Diyos kesa doon sa kanyang mga attributes. Now, meron pong isang grupo ng mga Hudyo, particularly yung tinatawag na Kabbalist, may ganyang pagkakaintindi. Pero hiwalay sila sa mga Hudyo na sen na uh, iba yung paniniwala nila doon sa mga hypostasis na ito. Ang mga Kabbalist kasi, meron sila ng tree of life. Ando doon yung uh, mga pangalan ng uh, uh, attributes ng Diyos nasa tingin nila ay hypostasis gaya nung uh, uh, yung bina that's one hypostasis yung malkut that's another hypostasis so sa kanila uh, attribute yun ng Diyos eh pero magiging klarado yun pagdating natin doon sa Christological heresies uh, kung kung i-discuss natin yan ngayon dito hindi mabibitin lang kayo <laughs> doon kasi sa grupo sa panayon Saka lang natin mabubuo yung konsepto ng esensya. At kung po pwede right. nga kayo, yeah, pwede nga kayong mag-aral o mag-attend ng philosophies, 
mas maigi para maintindihan natin yan. Ano ba? Yeah. Thank you, brother. Brother Resti. Apo, apo. Kasi, po, kasi nga po, sinasabi namin kanina, nung pre-Christian Judaism, yeah. ang pagkaintindi lang sa Diyos, ah, sa Spirit, sa Diyos ay pa- power of God. Yeah, right. Kaya nga, uh, of God. Tapos, kaya pag sinabi natin yung Spirit of God, to experience the Spirit of God, na-experience natin siya bilang God as a Spirit. Yeah. Tama. Kasi yun ang pagkaalam ng mga yun ang pagkaalam ng mga Hudyo noon. Yeah. Dahil nga kaya nga related siya sa hangin, sa hininga. Yeah. Oo. Yun. Pero ang ang yun kasi ang pagkakaintindi nila, the manifestation of uh, power of God oh, yeah. or the spirit of God ay isa hindi isang technically hindi isang persona. Uh, sa atin kasi mayroon na tayong dis, uh, delineation between the essence and the person. Yun ang pagkakaintindi natin. Kaya nga yung Trinitarian formulation natin ay ando doon na. Kasi anything that is relate, uh, relating to God or anything that you put, talk about God, uh, doon, kahapon pinag-usapan natin doon sa Christology, yun, na anything that you talk about God is actually God. Hindi mo pwedeng ihiwala yung gloria niya sa pagiging Diyos eh. Kaya nga may negative definition. Di ba kahapon pinag-usapan natin yung negative definition. You cannot you cannot define God because if you are able to define God then you are God. Pero hindi kaya hindi kayang ma-define ng tao ang Diyos eh. Kaya nga the only thing that we can uh, know about God is ano ba ang uh, pwede natin maintindihan sa pagiging naturalesa niya, na naturalesa ng Diyos, pero hindi natin pwedeng ihiwalay yung any attribute of God from God. Pag sinabi mong God is one, hindi mo pwedeng ihiwala yung one sa Diyos eh. Pag sinabi mong ang uh, ang uh, Diyos, kaya nga ngayon, pag sina- pagkakaintindi ng mga Kristiyano, pag sinabi mong Diyos ay Espiritu, hiwala yun basically sa kanyang personalidad because that was revealed. Okay? So, kaya nga po, Brother Resti, yeah. excuse me, yeah. kaya nga po, ginamit ng Diyos si Mama Mary para yung Spirit na hangin, o sa pag-alam natin hangin or breath, magkatawan tao, karna incarnation, kasi yun ang para ng Diyos para maging tao si ano ginamit niya si Mama Mary para masave tayo in the form of a uh, of human hindi so, wag mo sabihin natin, wag mong sabihin ginamit kasi para alalabas diyan you utilitarian ng Diyos eh hindi utilitarian ng Diyos eh ang Diyos ay pumili at malaya malaya ang sinasabi tinanggap, tinanggap ni Mama Mary Pwedeng so doon pa lang po na resting, pinapakita na rin yung power, manifestation ng power ni Lord. Ano po, di po ba? Yeah, Kaya yeah. na doon sa pagkatawang tao ni, ni Jesus. Yeah. At saka hindi yung spirit ang nagkatawang tao. Ah. Ang nagkatawang hindi tao po. ay ang salita. Sa ating pagkakaintindi bilang kristyano. Pero sa pinag-aaralan kasi natin, anong punto de vista ng mga udyo? Malina po yun ha? Nang kasi wala tayo doon sa theological discussion ng Christ- Christological heresies, no? Wala pa tayo doon. Pagdating natin doon sa Church Fathers at saka sa, uh, sa Metaphysics, pag-uusapan po natin yun. Ano pa? Okay, meron pa pong tanong. Heresy, so yes. po, pag didiscuss itong Spirit of God o relationship ni Jesus sa Spirit or whatever, Hmm. hindi pa ito mag, hindi natin makikita ang direct significance o relevance sa paano na develop ang incarnation techno uh, doctrine sa so may bandang dulo ng ano ng mga discussion natin dahil marami pang area na sinasaliksik eh ang uh, napag-usapan pa lang natin yung uh, uh, son of man napag-usapan pa lang natin yung son of god and then ano bang meaning niya and then ngayon yung angels at saka yung spirito may marami, marami pang iba. Last Adam pala, natapos na natin. By the time na matapos tayo dun sa may bandang 8th session or 9th session, makikita natin ngayon yung uh, iko-compile lang lahat na napag-usapan natin para malaman kung ano yung direction from the exegetical point of view kung bakit nabuo yung concept or na doktrina ng incarnation. So, sa may bandang dulo po ng se- seminar natin, mako-consolidate lahat ng pinag-aaral. Isa-isa tayong nag-aaral kasi. Okay pa? 
Mayroon pa pong tanong? Saka, Kuya Resti, sa yeah. ano, sa, sa yung time ng mga uh, pre-Christian Judaism, ang spirit, kilala rin bilang spirit of prophecy. Tama yeah. po ba? Yeah. Kasi, yun lang kasi, yun lang kasi, sa mga propeta. Yun lang kasi nakareveal sa Old Testament. Ang Diyos, pag nag, uh, nag uh, papahayag, ang spirito, no, ang ginagamit niyang vehikulo ay yung prophecy. Kaya nga nandun doon yung lahat, lahat halos mula kay Moises, ang tinawag na propeta, hanggang kay San Juan Bautista, tinawag na propeta din yun, basically. So yun yung, ano, yun yung konsepto ng mga Hudyo, dahil wala pa sa kanila yung konsepto ng uh, Usiyas, o Usiyat, yung uh, nature at saka, at saka hypostasis. So, hindi pwedeng masabi from the point of view of the Jews na merong hypostasis na idea ang mga Diyo. Kasi, ang sinasabi lang nila, yung mga tao na inakit sa langit, naging anghel, pero yung konsepto ng anghel, iba sa pagkakaintin nila sa uh, ating pagkakaintin nila sa hypostasis. Eh. Ang, uh, sa atin kasi may, may distinction yun. Yung pagiging, pagiging anghel ng isang tao ay tinatawag na apotheosis o yung pagiging divinized ng tao ay tinatawag na apotheosis pero yung hypostasis, iba yun kasi pinag-uusapan dyan yung naturalesa. Ang Diyos, pag nagkaroon ng hypostasis, anong naturalesa meron yung uh, pinag-uusapan? Okay pa? Yes po, thank you. Hindi ba, hindi ba ibig sabihin na hypostasis? ay postatis ano pa putting into reality something that is conceptual or uh, attribute so an an ano yung inaano nating ay postat ay before the the council of chalcedon which is actually the christological heresy ang ibig sabihin ng usias at saka hypothesis pareho na yung natural naturalesa ng dios yung essentia ng dios pero nung dumating yung Christological heresies, unti-unting na-define yun. Now, ang hypostasis sa Greek, sa, um, uh, sa, sa etymology ng Greek, hypo is under, stasis is to stand. To stand under. Yan ang pinakakuha ng hypostasis. So, so para bang sinasabi mo na, para bang nilalagyan mo ng ide- idealization or yung nilalagyan mo ng konsepto, yung isang something that is underneath yung sinasabi mo kang inang uh, uh, statement eh. So, nagkakaroon ng parang nadidefine mo na nagkakaroon ka ng idea from the point of view of the human. Eh. Kasi hindi naman, ang, hindi naman kailangan ng Diyos ay distinguish yung hypostasis niya eh. Tayo lang naman ang kinakailangan gawin yun para magkaroon tayo ng unawa because of reason. Ngayon ang pinag-uusapan natin kahapon when we were talking about faith and reason, ang pinag-uusapan doon is paano natin, pamamagitan ng ating pananampalataya, ay maintindihan natin ang Diyos eh. Kaya nga pinag-aaralan itong uh, mga bagay-bagay nito. At yung hypostasis na yan at saka yung usiyas ay papasok doon sa metaphysics at papasok doon sa church, uh, church fathers. Yan po yung pinakakuan dyan eh. Kaya yung, kaya so si Kristo, tinamang, ano ang hypostasis ni Kristo? Uh, sa kanyang pagiging Diyos, ano, yung kanyang naturalesa, pagiging dal- dalawa. Diyos siya at tao. Di ba, brother, siya sinasabi ng hypostatic union? Yeah. Yun nga, yung nadalawa. Sama yung nagsama yung pagiging Diyos, pagiging tao ni Kristo. Uh, yung, yung isang usiyas ni Kristo, ay yung, yung usiyas niya, yung uh, esensya niya bilang Diyos, ay kasama doon sa Trinitarian usiyas. No? Pero yung kanilang, ang kanyang naturalesa, uh, yung deity ng Diyos, Naturalesa ng Diyos yung deity. Oh. Pero si Christo... Oh, yes. Excuse me po. Ano, ano yung Osea? Essence po ba yun? Es- essence, opo. Yung ah, pinaka- okay. Thank you po. Thank you po. Actually, pareho yun. Essence sa hypostasis. Bago yung Christological uh, Christological heresis. No? Uh, pero nung magkaroon ng distinction ngayon, ang kinuha niya, Osea sa saka naturalesa. Para bang, uh, para bang klinaro. No? Yung essence ng Diyos isa lang. Okay? Pero ang manifestasyon ng esensya ng Diyos na ito sa naturalesa. Yung naturalesa na yun, ang iisang Diyos may naturalesa. Pero si Kristo, sa kanyang incarnation, eh, yung pinag-usapan natin ngayon, ay nag, uh, mayroong dalawang naturalesa. 
naturalis ang tao at saka naturalis ang Diyos eh. So yung hypostasis, ang ibig sabihin, what is underneath Christ, dalawa, naturalis ang tao at naturalis ang Diyos, ay nagkaroon ng un- unity, yung tinatawag na hypostatic union. Nagkaroon ng pag, eh, technically pagsasama yung naturalis ang Diyos at saka naturalis ang tao ni Kristo. Siya lang merong ganun. Okay? So, yun po yung kuha niya, yun yung binag-usapan natin ngayon. So, yung hypostasis na yan, ay hindi mo makikita sa anghel, hindi mo makikita doon sa dinidiscuss sa mga hudyo tungkol sa spirito. Wala sa kanilang idea, wala sa kanila yung idea na yun. Dahil kasi they are safeguarding yung kanilang monotheism. Dinidis, uh, dinid, eh, dinid, talagang talagang ginukuha nila yung pagiging monotheistic belief nila. Diba doon sa mga nakaraan, pinag-usapan natin yung dalawang powers in heaven, hindi nila tinanggap yun because that is heretical as far as the Jews are concerned. Kaya nga ito, uh, pag pinag-usapan mong hypostasis nung, ano, ng, uh, hypostasis nung spirito, hindi nila tatanggapin yun. Kasi uh, wala sa hinuha nila yung dalawang yun. Ginagawa lang nila yung mga kunyari, the spirit of God was hovering over the water. O, paano mag-hover ang spirit of God kung iisa lang yun, ang Diyos ba ay nasa lupa at pagkatapos nasa langit at the same time? Wala sa hinuha nila, hindi nila pinag-uusapan yun. Ang kanilang pinag-uusapan niyo, isang circumlocution, isang pagsasabi. Pag, uh, kaparaanan nila sa pagsabi ng isang bagay. Kaya yung spirito ng Diyos ay na hovering over the waters, yung puwersa ng Diyos yun na nag-hover over the water. Hindi nila, hindi, hindi nila ina hindi nila pinaghihiwalay yung power na yun at saka yung Diyos eh. Sa kanila isa lang yun. Kaya hindi, yung hypostasis as far as the user concerned ay hindi ginagamit sa kanilang monotheistic belief. Ayan pa? So, brother, yeah. sa ano kasi sa lumang tipan kasi o sa mga hudyo, ang Diyos sa kanila ay isang hindi makapangyarihan na hangin tulad nung nag-cross sila sa Red Sea o kaya isa ring hininga o kaya isang kaya nga di ba nung si Saul ay ano na kumbaga sa ano ay tawag nung bad shot na siya kay, kay God oh, umalis yung ang tawag nila doon ay the spirit of the Lord iniwan na si Saul hindi hindi necessarily yung Diyos yung may iwan kay Saul patay si Saul pag nangyari yun eh ang sinasabi lang doon yung puwersa ang, ang, oh, yun, yung, yung, yung ano nila yung, yung baka sana yung samahan nilang dalawa wala na si wala yeah. na ang Diyos sa kanya the power the power inalis yung grasya technically yung yung kuno yun yung grasya inalis sa kanya yung grasya pero hindi hindi sa kanila kasi hindi mo pwedeng uh, isipin na yung grasya ay Diyos no hindi mo rin pwedeng sabihin na yung hangin ay Diyos eh ay isang isang kaparaan lang sa pagsabi nila uh, isang kaparaan sa pagsabi nila na yung pwersa ng Diyos ay andi diyan kaya yung hangin Exactly. Synonymous with God's presence. Synonymous lang yun, pero hindi sila, hindi nila ginagawang uh, hypostasis, hindi nila ginagawang personification. Sa atin sa English ngayon, yung tinatawag na personification. The, the Jews do not personify uh, any of the attributes of God. Ayan pa? Yes po. Meron pa pong tanong so far? Brother, tama po ba sabihin Jesus is a divine God with human nature? Uh, divine God? Divine God talaga siya. Yung nga with, human, niya, but... with human nature. Hindi mo pwedeng sabihin na hihiwalay mo ang pagiging Diyos ni Kristo sa kanyang pagiging persona, si Jesus. Eh. Naturalesa niya, dalawa. He is both human and divine. So may 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 naturalis ang Diyos at may naturalis ang tao. So pag sinabi mo kasi he is a, a God with a human person, uh, ano yun, chapsoy, hindi ganoon eh. Ang yes. sabi natin dito, 100% tao, 100% God. Oh, 100% tao, 100% Diyos eh. Yun ang yun ang kwenta, yun ang kwenta ng, ng incarnation. Pero brother ST, yes. Yung siya sabing human nature na yan, nung buhay lang siya, naki naki nakipamuhay sa atin. Pero ngayon, totally Diyos na lang siya. 
Ay, 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 ay. Dala niya yung kanyang pagiging tao. Ah, hanggang ngayon, hanggang ngayon po. <laughs> Hindi mo pwedeng hiwalay sa persona niya. Pagkatapos niya, pagkatapos niya, bakit sa langit, naiwan dito yung pagiging tao niya. Or bit-bit niya yun. Hanggang, hanggang ngayon. ngayon si Kristo ay tao at Diyos. Hanggang Hindi ngayon po yun. Pagkiwalay niya. Okay. Right? Yes, God man, yes. Hanggang ngayon. Ay, nakaupo siya doon sa kwan, sa langit eh. God man siya. Kasi hindi siya yung ano siya yung magiging uh, tinaset pag nagkaroon ng beatific vision parang magiging ganun tayo. Yun ang yun ang uh, uh, yun ang naka-prenumesa uh, niyang eternal life eh. Magiging god man din tayo, ganun ba siya? O hindi o magi, ang magi, eh, para bang kung sa kwan is uh, siya yung naging modelo. Firstborn okay. son, firstborn magkakaroon tayo ng divinization din eh. Ang tao ay magiging parang, eh, hindi naman necessarily magiging God. No? Hindi yan. Divinization lang. Kung baga sa kwan, para bang we will partake. Na kasi hindi tayo pwede maging Diyos eh. But we can partake of that uh, etern- eternity. Because being eternal is God eh. Uh, that is, uh, di ba, pag sinabi mong God is eternal, God is good. Lahat yun ay Diyos eh. Yung pagiging good na yun, that is, good, that is God. Yung eternal, That is God. Pag sinabi mong we share in the eternity, we are actually sharing in the divinization. Kaya hey, para maging pag-inunite tayo, kinakailangan maniwala tayo kay Kristo. Okay? Ibig po bang sabihin, Brother Resti, darating po yung time na pati yung katawan natin is babalik sa ano, or kaluluwa lang po talagang... Meron tayong doktrina ng resurrection of the dead. Okay. Yung resurrection of the dead, magkakaroon tayo, sabi nga sa Pablo, doon sa kanyang sulat, magkakaroon tayo ng uh, spiritualized na katawan. Yung spiritualized na katawan niya, yung magsa- magsasama uli sa ating uh, kaluluwa, which is actually mag- mapupunta doon sa eternity, sa tinatawag nating langit. So hindi pwede yung pagpunta natin sa langit, spiritu lang. Hindi ka tao pag hindi, wala, wala kang katawan. Okay? So yung the resurrection of the dead, man yun ha, man. Kuya <laughs> Resi, yes, po. paano po yung naging abo na? Ay, tinatawaran mo ba yung pagka, ang kapangyarihan ng Diyos para ma-reconstruct yun? At saka hindi naman kinakailangan i-reconstruct yung wala na dahil ibibigyan tayo nung tinatawag na resurrected body. Eh, hindi ah, na po yung katawan na po yun? Walang, wal, walang corruption Parang yun. Parang angel na lang po. Bagong uh, katawa na po yung Broretti. Hindi yung katawa. Oo, nagkalabot na. Ang, ang, ang anghel kasi, walang katawan. Spirit lang yan. Ano? Ang sinabi, parang anghel. Ang ibig sabihin, yung ating, ating, ating spirito, sasani buli doon sa ating katawan. Bibigay na katawan. Hindi naman necessarily yung katawan na, na, na wala. Pwedeng gawin ng Diyos yun na i-reconstitute yun. Pero ang sinasabi sa scripture is bibigyan tayo ng isang uh, dito, spiritual body. Sabi ni San Pablo. Okay po, spiritual glorified body. Glorified body. body. Right. So yung, uh, yung glorified body na yun, or yung spiritual body, sabi nga kanina, spiritual body, uh, yun ang dadalhin sa langit, sa eternity. Kaya, ang, ay, may mga theologians na nagsasabi na pagdating mo sa langit, kikilala mo yung mga kasama mo dito. <laughs> na kasi hindi po, kung hindi, kung wala, kayo, wala yung katawan mo, eh, hindi, pwede hindi mo makilala yung mga kasama mo dito dahil wala kang mata, wala ka, wala espiritu lang. Eh, eh doon sa eternity na mayroong katawan, makikita mo yung mga dati mong kasama. Di ba? Okay. Right? Diba kaya resting din nakilala kaagad ni Magdalena si Jesus kasi spiritual hmm. iba kasi iba kasi body ni Cristo at the time kaysa doon sa uh, dati niyang pagkakakilala which is the, actually the human but sabi nga natin ando doon yung uh, light kaya hindi niya makikita talaga yan yung full light technically kasi pag sinabi mo yung MMT ni Cristo ang isang pwede maging image noon is yung light the divine light ay para bang dinim. Yung emptying na yun, parang dinim yung light. Nakita mo siya. Kasi para bang yung liwanag na hindi kaya ng, kaya na, kaya ng tao ay para bang itsinantabi muna. Kaya, kaya nakita ng mga tao si Kristo. Okay? Meron pa pong tanong. 
Baka na lang po out of topic po eh. Brother, no. basta emphasize, emphasize na 100% tao, 100% God. Yes. Okay, Yan thank you po. Yes. Okay, sige po. Meron po pong tanong. Alright. Kung wala nang tanong. Pastin, pastin na po. Pastin na, sige. <laughs> Meet na yung book class, exegesis. Pagkatapos, tingnan natin kung anong book class. Ano ba? Brother, pa-join sa exegesis. Mag-join ka lang. Ando doon sa balistahan naman na binigay sa'yo. Pa-link po. Pa-share na link. Ando doon sa binigay na link. Mga links. Apat na links yun. Check mo lang yung ano. Click mo lang yun. Sandali ako. Pag nag-enroll ka, Sister Winnie, automatic padadalang ka ng link. Meron Para po. lang po. Baka natabunan na yung ano mo. Bro, ba't ako wala? Kahit is malo lang ako ng hingi. Classroom po ang nakalagay. Wala po ngayon. Doon sa classroom, nag-check up 